Okay. Hi. I'm B.L. Ackman from What's Next blog, Beyond Social Media Show, and um, Ad Age Digital Next, among other things. And I'm here with Nova Spivak, who is from so many amazing achievements, most notably currently Bottlenose. Um, and we're here to talk about uh, what he is presenting right now in terms of his newest venture, but also I want to know how you got to where you are. So um, let me ask you, uh, you know, just the list of companies you've been involved with makes my head spin. Um, where did you start? Uh, well, I started um, my first kind of jobs in the tech industry were, were when I was in uh, college in Boston. And uh, I worked for Thinking Machines, which made supercomputers. Uh, and then I, I worked with uh, one of Ray Kurzweil's companies. Uh, and then I worked for a company called Individual Inc., which did filtered news, and, uh, and then I went to a space. Yeah, so I started young, and then I went to a space industry grad school after college, uh, and that led me to meet uh, Peter Diamandis. And I was going to ask you that. I figured you had to have been involved with him in the yeah. space venture. Yeah. 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 And then I uh, got involved in a bunch of things with him, and uh, and then when I came back from that, um, I ended up helping to start, a co-found a company called Earthweb in New York, which was one of the early web companies in 1994. And uh, we went public in 1998. Uh, and then out of that came Dice.com. And, and then I went and worked with SRI on their incubator and ended up doing some Dopper work that led to uh, the research that later became Siri uh, on the iPhone. And at that time, I uh, uh, ended up uh, helping to pioneer a number of the applications of the semantic web, the actual semantic web, uh, in the Tim Berners-Lee sense of the word. And then um, helped start Clout, and then uh, the Daily Dot, Live Matrix, and Bottlenose. Uh, and uh, Bottlenose is really what I'm focused on now, full time. So uh, Bottlenose seems to be doing several different things. Can you give its main thrust in a couple? Yeah, of Bottlenose. Bottlenose does uh, real time trend intelligence. So we detect trends for brands. Um, and, and large enterprises uh, in real-time social streams. So we're taking social firehose data you know, from Twitter and Facebook and, and other networks, blogs, forums, uh, Tumblr, WordPress, and so forth, taking these firehoses of data, uh, principally uh, from social networks like Twitter, and we're analyzing them uh, in real time to find uh, what trends have the most momentum uh, for big brands. So, for example, for a company like Pepsi that we work with, uh, you know, we're constantly uh, data mining everything around Pepsi and the artists they sponsor and all of their different brands, their competitors, their customers, the whole market, to understand what trends are emerging in real time as well as over longer time periods that might be important for Pepsi uh, strategically uh, as an advertiser for their media strategy, for the research and planning. Uh, for live events and activations that they do. So really providing a comprehensive real-time view of the marketing landscape around Pepsi. That's one example. Well, I have enough knowledge in this area to be dangerous. I work with Sysimos and, and uh, I've tried, I, I've tested because I've used them for clients, probably 50 different platforms. What distinguishes you from, there are now minimally 500 companies. Oh, yeah. That, Claim to do this. So, what distinguishes Bottlenose? Yeah, I mean, there's there there were a lot of companies, um, you know, in first first and second generation social listening platforms um, like Radiant Six and Sysimos and others. Uh, and what those tools do, it, kind of what we think of as classical social listening, where you track, for example, mentions of your account, likes, follower counts, and sort of standard KPIs around particular accounts you own. What Bottlenose does that's different is we actually uh, do a really huge amount of data mining. Uh, so we start with a term like, let's say, Beyonce um, for Pepsi, continuing with that example. So uh, Pepsi sponsors Beyonce. And so um, what we do is um, we pull in all messages uh, that mention Beyonce, and then we data mine them in real time to find... So let's say on Twitter that's about 4 million messages a month on, on average. Okay. And then we, we data mine those, uh, and we find, using natural language processing, we find about two and a half million entities, uh, people, topics, and links that are relevant to Beyonce. And then for each of those entities, we then 
measure each one uh, using 116 different analytics, uh, which yields about uh, two and a half billion time series, um, which is roughly 220 billion data points. So we then take that big collection of data and we analyze it uh, to find trends. So that's quite different. You know, classical social listing would take the word Beyonce, maybe they'd look for her social account, um, or they'd measure mentions of literally that word. And so you know, you'd have one time series um, you know, with some analytics about this one thing. What we do is we look around it, we look at everything. So it's orders of magnitude bigger. And what that means is we find the unknown unknowns. So we find terms that you didn't know to search for that are emerging or changing. Um, that and, are and you showed that they're connected. I, I, you know, I was playing with it this morning. The, the Twitter um, uh, one that the you sonar, made. yeah. And uh, you know that that's what I found so interesting is that you showed how they connected. But yeah, a lot what, of people what I compare. dislike so much about Radiant Six at all is I don't want a river of data. Right. You know, that's so the last I mean, thing the I want. First generation tools took a fire hose and basically give you they gave you a fire hose, and you yeah. have to kind of sort through a fire hose yourself, which is not. You know, it worked when there wasn't as many messages, when volume was lower, but now volumes are you know, so many times larger than they were in you know, 2009. And so you know, the volume is so huge that you've got to have a tool that goes through it and finds what's important and shows you what the connections and the context uh, is around everything. And so that's really the key. You know, we find these unknowns. So you know, to do what Bottlenose does, the classical social listening tool, you would have to act, literally you'd have to make thousands of queries. You know, and in our case, you can just put in one word, and, and Bottlenose does the rest automatically. Now, based on what? I mean, what so we've developed, right? We we've developed, uh, you know, since since 2010, we've been working on a, a a new platform for trend intelligence, for trend detection in these streams. And so it consists of uh, a new natural language technology we developed, which finds topics and concepts uh, in these streams without any kind of a dictionary, you just can see everything and linguistically can figure out what's a topic. And then it also classifies the messages into uh, 100 and just roughly 150 different kinds of message. You know, is it an opinion or what kind of an opinion is it? Is it a complaint? Uh, we see different types of emotions. So not just sentiment. We, we see sentiment, um, but we also see what kind of emotion it is. Is it joy? You know, is it, is it desire? Is it anxiety? Um, so we, we, we really have a deep psychographic, demographic, semantic view of what's happening in the stream. So that Does flows that up through the... Mean, so, Does that mean that if you see you guys are fucking great, you have a way? <laughs> That's the hardest yeah, one yeah. Ideally, um, you know, terms like, uh, expressions like that, um, we, we can see them clearly and we can detect uh, and tune the system to handle them. There's lots of different kind of colloquial, ex colloquial expressions that people use. Um, that you have to teach it, but um, yeah, in theory, it can see that. It can also see, you know, for example, that if sentiment is positive for a brand, why? What kind of emotion is that? It could be, you know, it could be joy. You know, it could be, uh, it could be. Um, Expressions of glory. It could, you know, there are these different kinds of emotion. So, and what kind of a report do you produce? So, that? actually, it's a it's a big dashboard that's web based, and it shows you uh, many many different dimensions of what's going on. So, you can see, you know, Sonar View, which we just released a free version of that anybody can play with. You can just go to sonar.bobblenose.com and play with that. That's a on a one percent sample of the data, but it's still pretty cool. Um, so there's that view, which is a live view. That's the other thing we do that's different is it's very live. The other tools give you more of a static, kind of old-fashioned tag cloud view of things. You have to refresh. This is totally live. Uh, you can see things kind of changing and bubbling up. So you have that. Then you have a, a view that shows breaking news and popular links in real time, and they kind of move up and down in this leaderboard. Uh, same thing with images. And then uh, there's an activity view, which shows uh, a bunch of Things like volume and impressions, um, the media mix, you know, how many, what percent are videos versus photos, uh, the types of messages. Then there's a, a demographic view, uh, which shows you know, demographics, geography, a bunch of other attributes of the audience. We can drill down into everyone, every person who talks about a brand and analyze them. Uh, and then there's a view, a trends view, which tracks all the trends. Yeah, so if you take something like Pepsi, for example, on a month time scale, 
we're tracking you know well over a million related trends for Pepsi uh, continuously, and and we we've got analytics for all of them. So it's as if you did a million queries in a Radian Six. That would be like a million queries. What's the learning curve for the brand? And it's quick. It takes like and it's it's quick. It, the the tool is actually quite simple to use. Uh, a lot of what we've done is automated under the hood. So it's you know getting getting a brand set up is about an hour. Um, really? And then yeah, and then we you know you can click around. It's pretty easy to use. There's no training, uh, although we do teach brands how to get the best practice. You know, sort of some of the best practices we figured out. Um, it's quite easy to use. And in fact, there's a bunch of screenshots you can see on our site at bottlenose.com, uh, which show pictures of kind of how it looks. It's very game-like in a way, and and sort of easy to use, like a almost like a kind of content portal, but it's analytics. Well, I, you know, I really can't wait to take a deeper uh, look at it. Um, one of the things you just mentioned was uh, the cement. Before we started this hangout, we were talking about the semantic web, and and you just brought that up. And when we spoke before, you said the semantic web is over. Yeah, now, well, explain that web, to me. <laughs> the semantic web um, didn't didn't develop the way that we all thought or hoped that it would. Which uh, was the know. connection of all databases to each other. For the purpose of mining, right? Yeah. Well, you know, the original Semantic Web was based on these open standards um, called RDF and OWL, um, which were proposed by the W3C. And At the beginning. Yeah. And these standards um, provide a way to mark up data so that machines can can disambiguate the meaning. So using ontologies. So for example. You know, um, you could put these special tags around things, almost like HTML tags, but they would say what the semantics are. So, you know, you mention a company's name and you would tag it with company, right? And if you mentioned a place, you'd tag it with place. But the question is, you know, what does company mean? What does place mean? So <laughs> the semantic web provided a way to to link those to formal definitions that a machine could understand. You know, that a company is an organization which is also considered a legal person. Um, and can be incorporated, and there's different kinds of company, and companies have employees. All of that was defined in a formal, machine understandable way. So what what that meant is anybody could tag their data with anything. They could invent their own tags, but it, these tags would link to these definitions that machines can understand. So the next thing is you could actually link these definitions to each other. So you could say company and corporation are synonyms, and then two people using these different terms in their data. Um, any system that I was searching would be able to find both under either term. It's my so understanding this, that news organizations have already been um, uh, working on their yeah. databases, in fact, for years. Well, so the thing is, in news, that in, worthwhile? in news organizations, they use controlled vocabularies and their own taxonomy. So, for example, Reuters has one that they use. Um, they all have their own. And so that that's fine if you're searching within that site and just their content. But right. if somebody wanted to make say a next generation Google that could search all, across all news sites um, using you know a common set of terms and find everything then there'd need to be some kind of semantic agreement um, between them about what their tags mean and that was what the semantic web was supposed to do so where the semantic web did and still does have some traction is in some big enterprise systems integration contexts where in a big company they have all these different databases and schemas and they want them to work together where it didn't catch on was out on the consumer web with content providers and, and sort of the public uses of the web. What happened instead was brute force, the Google approach, which basically posits that you know you don't need to define anything, we'll just make software smarter. And the whole idea of the semantic web was software could be dumber, that more of the knowledge would be in the data, and the software could be dumber. Um, the data would carry its own meaning. So now, instead, what's happened is this brute force approach where uh, you know, Google and others have, have tried to build smarter and smarter search algorithms that can try to figure out what the content means or what your query is asking for. Um, and they, they do a pretty good job. However, not nearly as good as, as what the world would be like if everybody used these semantic web standards. Problem is, learning semantic web standards and implementing them uh, proved to be too difficult. You needed a, a master's degree or a PhD you know, in logic or linguistics or computer science to really use these things. And that was the problem. They just, they're way too difficult for your average um, webmaster to, to do. Please, Boolean search is too difficult for most yeah. people. Yeah, I mean, most people don't even use advanced search. Right? Yeah. They're not going to use, you know, first order predicate logic. 
So well, that's you know that's not going to change seriously. Right, that's but, not going to change. So, and so, so it sounds to me like if you're using bottlenose as a Pepsi, for example, it's a competitive advantage to have that kind of tool. Yeah. So what bottlenose does, in a way, it figures out the semantics of social data automatically for you, and so this whole stack we've developed effectively is marking up all of the social data from big firehose streams with all of the semantic metadata that we discover. So what are the topics? Who are the people? What, t what, are the, what's the, what kind of message is it? That's all semantic processing, but it's not semantic web. The distinction is that the semantic web, literally capital S, capital W, was a set of open standards that didn't really take off. But semantics did take off. Semantics just means meaning. And there's tons of things. Google is semantic. Anything that figures out meaning is semantic. So Ray Kurzweil, did you go, by the way, to Avatar uh, 2045? Were you there? The uh, I wasn't. I wasn't there. Y you were? No, I was not. Oh, you were. Oh, I went. It was fascinating. Oh, cool. But um, Ray Kurzweil has said that you know all knowledge is going to be online by uh, very soon. Uh, I agree. I mean, I suspect th that. I, I I think all of consensus reality will be will be represented online. Now, there's a whole other big class of knowledge that's bigger, which is your own personal experience, you know, your own personal knowledge. A good portion of that is getting digitized, but, but the vast majority is not. I mean, I, I'm having all of these senses and perceptions, experiences, and they're all getting digitized. So um, all the things that you do and all of the pursuits that you have, I mean, there are only 24 hours in a day. Are you the most organized person I've ever met? or? You know, how, how does it all come together for you? Uh, you well, like, I mean, number one, I don't, do. I don't really sleep that much. Um, <laughs> how much that do you helps. Sleep? Um, you know, I typically sleep, well, on average, any, you know, four hours, maybe five hours. It's probably not that healthy, um, <laughs> but that helps. But also, uh, yeah, I mean, I've definitely, I'm a, I'm a very fast reader. Uh, that came from one of my jobs, actually, when I, when I worked at Individual, we were doing filtered news. Uh, the system worked, there were all these intelligent agents that would filter news wires and, and provide sort of buckets of possible stories to humans like me, and then we'd have to go through them and decide which stories to keep and which ones to throw out. So I used to have to read about 1,600 articles a night and decide if they were good and decide which customers to go, ah. go to. So I developed an ability to read very quickly um, and type very quickly, um, which helps a lot. Uh, and then other than that, you know, I, I think... Um, I'm probably fairly organized, but in a in a very chaotic way. How did your How did you choose your career path? What did you study in school? I actually um, studied philosophy with a focus on cognitive science and artificial intelligence. So and I was was that kind of a major? <laughs> well, I went to Oberlin, and at Oberlin, um, I actually created my own major in the in the. It was called cognitive science, but that proved to be too much paperwork. So finally, the philosophy department allowed me to just do it in their department. Uh, and it basically was neuroscience, computer science, linguistics, philosophy, um, and, and a little bit of math uh, and some physics, which is basically all around, my focus is really what is consciousness, how does, what is, what's intelligence, how important is consciousness to intelligence, and what's the relationship between consciousness and intelligence. It's a big question. What is the relationship to consciousness? Wow. Well, that's a very, that's a long discussion. Um, okay. It's a long discussion. I mean, how does but, that affect your work, uh, is what I'm really asking you. Well, I mean, I, I think it's affected my work in the sense that um, a lot of what I've done over the last several years has been around collective intelligence. You know, with Twine and, and Twine.com was one of the first semantic web search engines we built, built, and it was trying to allow communities to collect and organize knowledge. Um, with Bottlenose, we've taken it another step. We've automated it completely. So effectively with bottlenose it's a different approach but what we're doing is we're visualizing the collective consciousness of the world uh, around every topic there is um, so you know, what is the global brain or global mind thinking uh, about Nike or Pepsi or Warner Brothers or a particular movie we can actually see what the world is thinking in real time and actually see those thoughts they look almost like you know what you'd expect, it's kind of like an MRI of the global brain. You can see these kind of networks moving around and shifting, uh, and you can see the topics. But what do you do they relate. with that? What, well, what brands, brands use it, uh, for example, to find keywords to advertise on. So if you look in Sonar, and you t let's say you went into Sonar and you typed NFL. And if you want to advertise to people who care about the NFL, 
Sonar will show you actually what is trending right now for everybody who thinks about the NFL. So it's a real-time view of the trending topics around the NFL. And if you take those orange terms that are popping out and you put them into your ad targeting, turns out you get really good results. We've, we've had clients use us in that way uh, and get uh, 10 times better ad engagement than national averages just using the data from Sonar. So That's if you want to reach people... Sorry? That's very significant. Yeah, it's very significant. Um, I mean, we've, we've had one, one big client get about a 19% national engagement rate on Twitter for their promoted tweets, and the national average is 2%. Um, I'm surprised it's that high. I, I wonder, do you also know what else has the attention of people who are concerned about the NFL? You know, uh, are they interested in, in cooking? Are they soccer players? Yeah, so, we can, so there's a couple things we can do there. Number one is we, we see everything they're talking about and what, the, what links they're sharing and sort of a view of everything that specifically mentions, say, the NFL. The other thing that's interesting is we can take an entire audience, let's say a million people who follow the NFL, and then we can actually look at everything they talk about, not only NFL-related, but everything, and then pull out all kinds of insights about the affinities, brands, other events and other things that are on their minds, and who they are, where they are, uh, what percent of them are soccer moms versus you know professional football players. So we can really slice and dice the audience and, and literally see what that population is thinking about. And so it's a way we can actually profile entire audiences or brands, not just specifically with respect to their actual terms, but with respect to everything that's on the minds of their customers. It's so big, though. Yeah, I mean, that's this is big data. This is, the, you know... We're looking at literally hundreds of billions to trillions of, of data points, you know, every day. And, and focusing them into usable information. Right, and the key is it's this ability to, to find the patterns or what we call the trends that have trend fluence. So this is a term we coined. Um, you know, there are all kinds of things which could be trends, uh, but not all of those trends matter. So which trends really have influence? Which trends really have impact? Uh, and no, that's really... You tell that. I mean, how, how do you know what has staying power? Things go so fast. Right. I mean, a great example is Sharknado. Right? I don't know if you, you heard about yeah, Sharknado. Yeah, for a week, right? Two right. weeks. So there was a ton of, of volume of conversation, lots of messages. And if you, if you just looked at volume, you'd think, wow, you know, ratings are going to be incredible. Well, ratings were lukewarm. They weren't incredible. So, you know, volume isn't enough to tell you that something is going to really have impact. Um, and by the way, interestingly, interestingly enough, you know, Nielsen has just come out with this NTTR social rating through Social yeah. Guide, yeah. and all they're doing is measuring volume. So it's quite, in my opinion, quite naive. I think so, uh, too. We, we're looking at 116 different metrics around every trend. And so it's a lot more than volume. Volume is just one of those 116 metrics. So when we look at a trend, um, we're looking at uh, many different factors uh, in our algorithm, you know, in particular, how influential are the people who are talking about the trend, uh, what's the engagement like, uh, how is it moving, what is sentiment, how is it, you know, behaving. And so, uh, you know, trends that have trend fluence have effectively more momentum. Um, and momentum is not just velocity or not just volume, but there's a mass element to momentum, right, because momentum is mass times velocity. So in our case, mass is complicated. There's lots of different things that go into that. Uh, but when we, when we have mass times velocity, you can see momentum. And that, that is a much richer way to understand if a trend really has shove, you know, if it really has oomph behind it. How did this algorithm, how long did it take to develop this algorithm? This sounds like a long-term process. Yeah, I mean, we've been working on it. This is year four now. So we've been building this for four years. Uh, and there's still lots to do. Uh, you know, Google, if you look at PageRank, it's an ongoing thing, and they never stopped innovating that. Well, same, it will never be done. That's right. And same thing with this, you know, with, with you know, what we're doing around trends. You know, it's, a, it's continuous. It's always, we're always adding to it. Um, and to some degree, you know, as we start sharing more of what we're doing, you know, it could be an arms race with people. You know, if enough people pay attention to it uh, and they start to game the system, you know, then we'll have to adapt. But, uh, you know, right now, really, we've been kind of the secret weapon of a number of, of big brands. We haven't really released it publicly until... Just recently, we announced Nerve Center, which is our enterprise product, and we just gave away this free version. But the trend stuff and just trend fluence stuff, we have some announcements coming around that where we'll start to roll out more of that algorithm. So uh, people always do learn to game the system. You know, how long do you think that's going to take? Well, I think, I mean, people are already trying. So you see, you know, there's a lot of spam activity in social media. 
today. Oh God, it's unbelievable. Right, and people are trying to they're trying to use social as a way to do SEO. Um, you know, because for example, it turns out Google pays attention to Google Plus, and you know all these different things. So there's lots of different attempts, but it's a it's a bit of a new world. Um, I think social quote social SEO or the equivalent of, of trying to get attention in the stream. Um, it's going to be an interesting area. I mean, there's been a fundamental shift in the last year or two in, in, in how people use Twitter, in my opinion. It used to be that people consumed a lot of Twitter content. You know, you'd actually kind of follow what people were saying and get your news from Twitter. Uh, you know, speaking for myself, I found that behavior, I really stopped doing that because there's just too much noise. There's too much... If you follow even a few hundred people uh, and brands, I mean, you're just getting just inundated with stuff. So it's it's I'm I'm mostly posting to Twitter. I'm not really consuming Twitter, and I think a lot of people are doing that now. They're posting because they hope somebody's paying attention, um, but they're not really consuming Twitter the way they used to. So who's really listing? Well, the answer is brands. Brands are listing. That's who's really listing to what you post on Twitter. Uh, you know, probably not your friends anymore. You know, they're on Facebook. <laughs> That's oh, where they're listening. Oh, you think so? I don't know. My friends are on Google Plus right or now. Or Google Plus. Yeah, Google yeah. Plus for certain circles is, no pun intended, you know, a highly engaged audience. More of a niche audience, but highly engaged. So, um, in terms, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. In terms of your involvement with the many companies you've been part of, what is your role here, and then how long do you stay involved? So my, my role in Bottlenose is full-time, and, and that's the only full-time role I have right now. Um, I've actually scaled back my other activities to focus on this. I'm still on a couple boards, and I, I, you know, I'm an angel investor, and I advise some startups, but it's a very small percentage of my time right now, um, and I'm just totally kind of laser-focused on Bottlenose. There's a lot to do. Um, you know, so that's really kind of my, my passion right now. And you know, my involvement in this particular company, I, I, you know, I don't see an end to it. Uh, it's, a, it's a really... It's a big intellectual challenge. That's the kind of thing I like to sink my teeth into. You know, it could, you know, it's a Google scale type of problem and opportunity. And depending on what happens, you know, it could be something that, uh, you know, ha can go on for for a long time. Uh, so I'm pretty interested in it. I can't, I so can't really Google see myself. Is Google buy you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Ask them. <laughs> but so, what's next for you? Uh, you you think you'll be uh, here I mean, in the next period of time? What's next is right now is really building Bottlenose up, and you know we're we're starting to roll it out to a lot of big brands. So right now it's mostly you know Fortune 500 companies that we're working with, um, and we'll be rolling out a bunch of things this year that will start to make it available to broader sets of users. For example, the free sonar that we released today. So there'll be other things like that coming to kind of open a, open this up to more people, so that more people can benefit from it. Can you give um, me a but, price range for using it? Well, the enterprise version. Um, you know, is a big data solution. So it's it's a six-figure type of thing. Um, well, many of these are. I mean, that's yeah. Not... I mean, that's not uncommon. Um, right. For you know, I think uh, you'll see some lower price things coming out of us. You know, later um, to target teams, departments, at you know, small businesses, individuals. But that that'll come. Um, but first, we're really focused on these big, sort of premier kind of global brands, uh, where we a, a we get a lot of learning. B the revenues. Are important, you know, for a growing startup, we've got to focus where the money is, and so that's really where you get revenues today. Uh, and then, that, you know, as we go, we'll open this up to broader audiences, and I can see a lot of opportunity actually in the middle of the market eventually. It's so we'll it's it's sort of uh, you know ignored by a lot of companies. Uh, I have yeah. one big question for you. Sure, sure. What inspires you? Oh wow. Um, uh, well, you know, I'm I'm really obsessed with this idea of the global brain. Uh, I think it's been a big theme in my work, uh, definitely for the last 10 years, if not longer. I mean, it was actually the original idea, even when I did EarthWeb, <laughs> I actually was writing about it, and I tried to get an article into Wired, you know, when I was 20-something, uh, right after Wired had started on the global brain. And I, I, you know, Kevin Kelly has done a, a great job, I think, of really taking that topic and writing about it. But, um, you know, I think the global brain is... You know, well, in a million years, when we, when our ancestors look back from their flying saucers at what happened on Earth in this period of time, um, you know, one of the big things that will stand out is the birth of a new level of intelligence on this planet. 
um, a, a level, a form of intelligence that transcends the individual. Um, and it, it started, you know, if you trace it back, it, it started, um, in a way you could say it's existed as long as humans have. It began with oral traditions and then writing and then really with limited manuscripts and, and early universities uh, and then eventually uh, you know, with the printing press, when we freed knowledge from the individual brain, uh, well, what's going on now is this, is a kind of a next step. So, you know, the semantic web, the goal of the semantic web was to kind of do the next step after the printing press. So, the printing press took knowledge, but you still had the in, you had to have intelligence in your own head to make sense of the knowledge. The semantic web tried to put the intelligence on the web too, right? So, it was trying to do for intelligence what printing presses did for knowledge to put the intelligence in a machine understandable, reusable form. Now, what's going on with the stream is even one step beyond that. It's consciousness. What we're actually doing is we're, we're actually aggregating and reflecting back collective consciousness of the world uh, in real time to everyone. Um, and so this is kind of a new level of intelligence or consciousness on the planet that doesn't belong in anyone's head. It's, and it can only be formed out of the collective. So, you know, we get millions of people talking about Beyonce and there's actually something there. There's a collective experience that's being shared. There's a thought or a theme or a set of topics and trends that are connected. Creative commons. Yeah, it's moving. It's changing. It's actually a, a kind of a thing, really, this, this collective thought, what the world thinks about Beyonce today or what the world thinks about Apple. Uh, this is a, there's an issue that, that I worry about, and that is, you know, nothing in history prepared us to work the way we do with this this kind of bombardment of information yeah. and, and you know I don't know about you you seem to have this very focus but there are times when you know it, it, you just can't digest of all of this you just yeah. can't absorb it we're well, not prepared I mean, all, to work in this way yeah I mean humans the human body and brain um, will change over a period of time to adapt to this and we already have seen some of these changes um, there have been some studies on the brains of kids who play video games and they're different they're a little bit different. They're wired a little bit differently. Kids who've grown up in the digital era are wired differently than people who didn't grow up that way. Is that a good uh, thing? Uh, well, it's from a perspective of, of, of natural selection, it's a good thing. So if if natural selection says that you know success today and survival and the ability to make money and, and mate and, and, and be you know a successful depends on being able to handle information and juggle lots of tasks and, and move very quickly and have good hand-eye coordination then it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, now, from the perspective of maybe, you know, classical education, liberal arts, um, you know, the, the world that you and I grew up in, uh, no, maybe it's not a good thing because what we're, we're, we're doing is we're creating these kind of almost robots, you know, that are really good at processing information but not very good at thinking. Yeah, well, that's an issue. That's a big yeah. issue. Yeah. But Howard Rheingold teaches this course that I took called Infotension. And you know, just talks about how you decide what's worth your attention, and and I, and I do the Pomodoro method because otherwise I would never get anything done ever. And there's and this, you know, the idea of continuous partial, partial, continuous partial attention, and the and, and just the fact that we're multitasking. Everybody's multitasking. Nobody even reads anymore. You, you know, don't it's, read. It's hard to read or write anything longer than 140 characters today. <laughs> You know, <laughs> which is terrible. I think print books and print are really kind of an endangered species. Um, oh, I hope not. I hope not too. It's sad. Um, you know, the the fact that everything's going digital, you you lose the physical component to information. So the you know it used to be great to go into a library and look through the stacks, or to go to someone's house and look at their books or look at their record collection, and that told you something about them. And now you can't really do that anymore. I mean, unless you unless they give you access to their iPad. Right. You know. <laughs> so there's this physical presence of 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 knowledge and information and content, which is. It's you know it's getting miniaturized and sucked into these devices, and no longer it's, it's no longer part of our physical environment. And so we're in this weird place where, you know, for a while media was part of our physical experience, and now it's it's moving into these devices. And so it's a disconnect between the world we live in and the world that media is in. But that will change. Uh, I think with augmented reality in particular, that may change. So, oh you know, wow! Used, everybody used to think that you know, the future was virtual reality. We were all going to go, we we're going to leave this experience and kind of go into these kind of wombs or eggs, you know, where we kind of tune out and go into some virtual world. But actually the opposite is happening. The virtual world is going to come into the physical world. Um, and it's going to happen through things like Google Glass um, or other devices that 
um, bring augmented experiences, bring digital experiences into the physical world. So what about relationships? How does that impact relationships? I mean, are we going to still have them? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're, yeah, we're still going to have them. They might be more quantified. Uh, yeah. You know, so there's a whole quantified self movement. There's there, there's going to be a lot of measurement, and right now we're kind of intoxicated with measuring everything. I think we'll get over that actually I after hope so. a while. It's a little daunting. It's not very human, you know. Um, right now, everybody's excited about what you can do without asking why you can do it. You know, why do we do it? But um, you know, relationships, the face-to-face -face aspect of relationships. Um, I, th I think there'll be a kind of a backlash, and it'll come back. Um, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. But you know, we're in this phase right now where you know everything's being virtualized and everything's being um, you know, ev geography is becoming less less important. You know, even Google Hangouts, for example. I love them. I mean, you know, how else? No, they're great. There's yeah. a, there's there are, there are, there's something great about it. Um, yeah. You know, but on the other hand. Um, we're in this kind of push-button, drone-based well, kind of can't world. Hug. You can't hug, you know, and, but you can kill with the push of a button. Oh, you know? God. Right? And so it's this weird moment um, where we haven't really figured out how we, as humans, kind of coexist with all of this data that we're creating. Um, and, you know, it's almost like the data has become more important than us. Um, and, you know, we're giving up quality of life and sacrificing our rights and all kinds of things are happening, you know, for this data. Um, well, this you and cry right now about Google taking your image and putting it in as, I personally think they presented it wrong. That's kind of weird. The same way yeah. that they got people to pay $1,500 to beta test the Google Glass, which is anything but ready for market, because I did try it, mm -hmm. you know, if they had said to people, you have the opportunity now to have a billion people hear your opinions, people would have lined up. They would have right. paid. <laughs> right. It's, instead of instead, of, they should have said, "Look, we're going to promote you rather yeah. than we're going to use you." It's just a it was a bad spin. Privacy? There's no privacy. Yeah. You got your first credit card. You gave up your right. privacy. I, I mean, I think instead of that? privacy, there's transparency. You know, there's where you know we can expect uh, basically that, that everything is going to be visible to any to, to somebody who wants to know. Um, <laughs> but the positive side of transparency is that um, when you do have that expectation, you actually start to behave yourself. Right. One and hopes. So, I one mean, one hope. So you know, if everybody knows that you know, um, their 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 photos could be shared, you know, they probably will be more careful about what they take pictures of. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it, and I you know I think it's on some level, transparency can actually have a positive result in, in the sense you know the lack of privacy is not always a good thing, but at the same time, there's some level at which you know when when you can't hide bad behavior. Um, then people actually tend to behave better. Well, if you don't want it known, you should not put it out there. Uh, you know, that seems pretty simple. Yeah, I think there's also just some basic learning. But, you yeah. know, I, what I really worry about is, is just teenagers, you know, they just really, I mean, if, if, if digital tools had existed when I was a teenager, you know, I'd probably be afraid to show my face today. I mean, I, 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 I did know so many I stupid things as a teenager, and if I'd had more ways to do stupid things I, and reach more people with my stupid ideas at the time, <laughs> it would have been devastating, and I'd never be able to escape from that. So what worries me really is that, you know, teenagers, it, there's almost no room for error now. You know, anything That's you do, true. any stupid thing you do as a teenager will haunt you for the rest of your life, and that to me is kind of a problem because you know, one of the great freedoms of, being a kid and being a teenager is you do get to try stuff and you have to be able to make mistakes because you have to learn from mistakes. Sometimes other people's mistakes, sometimes your own. But now, you know, mistakes have long, far-reaching consequences. They're not as, you know, they're not. It's not. It's not as safe to make mistakes. You have. We have to become more forgiving of things like that. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah. ultimately, people if everybody had a sex, tape, if everybody had a sex tape and everybody had drunken party photos and everybody had, you know, posted some stupid things on Facebook. You know that would help because then everybody would be like, "Okay, big, big deal." But right. what's happening right now is it's you know it's still kind of rare. It's only celebrities, and so uh, or you know the occasional accidental congressman. And so you know <laughs> as a result, it's still a novelty, and and so it's a it's causing a problem. But I think over time, you know, hopefully, you know, people will learn how to behave in this digital environment, uh, and also will not be as shocked, you know, that that people are people. 
Well, that kind of falls to the parents and the educational system to, you know, explain this so that there's not all this pain. But there it, almost needs to be kind of kids are going basic, to be kids. There needs to be sort of digital literacy and digital digital citizenship kind of training in high school, junior high. You know, almost kind of like, here's what will happen. You know, here are some stories. Like, so-and-so yeah. was 16, and this happened, and like 50 years later, they're still dealing with it. Like, let this be a lesson to you, kid. Well, kids need to hear this stuff and learn this when they're in school. Um, they don't. You know, so. Yeah, and then cyberbullying is another horrible thing. You know, oh, awful. It's, so, you know, there's just a whole, there's a whole range of new challenges that, all, that come from all of this. Um, and lots of new opportunities and you know I think at least with Bottlenose what we're trying to do is just at least make things more visible just just being able to see uh, the forest instead of just the trees to try to show people the patterns um, and what's happening you know in the digital landscape in the social landscape and to, to show them the trends at least starts to make it more visible because one of the challenges has been you know it, the social environment this digital social landscape has been just a wilderness really um, and you know, it's been very hard to even know what was going on. So I think that's starting to change. Here, really. <laughs> yeah, it's a wild west, and we're you know we're kind of mapping it. At least that's a start. Well, I, I think Bottlenose is absolutely fascinating, and I'm really thrilled to have this time to talk to you. I just want to know: Is Nova your real name? Yeah, that's my real name. Um, it it's is not, not a hippie moniker. It's my real name. My uh, my mom was a poet. It still is, ah, okay. um, and so there was a story behind it. But yeah, that's my real name. I thought I thought you were going to tell me now. <laughs> no, that's a that's, not, that's a story for another time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I thank you so much for your time. I may have some other questions, in which case sure. I'll holler. But um, this has really been an education for me, and I think that uh, you know what I learned from you here. I will try and um, explain and. 500 words. <laughs> Terrific. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> That's why we still need journalists. <laughs> yes. Really. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.